Broadcasting live from the WGBB World Headquarters here in New York. This is the Big Fat Joey Show with your host, Big Fat Joey. Hey, hey, good morning, everyone. Big Fat Joey, Big Fat Joey Show. Biggest thing on real. Happy Memorial, Lil Sin. What's up? Memorial Day weekend. I wait all year for this. It's finally here. That it is, that it is. Great, great day yesterday. You know, I give it a, a you know, nine thumbs up on a scale of one through ten. It was a pretty decent day. Some showers and clouds here and there, but overall, good, good day. Especially if you picked up another bag yesterday. Yes, it has my favorite location on it, the Hamptons from Therapy Life and Style. Kelly got some adorable bags in, and um, I love it. It was just really busy, and I heard you're really busy today, too. We've got a busy, busy show today. First and foremost, we have on... Royal expert and commentator, as well as founder of the British Monarchist, Thomas Mace Archer Mills. He is the inspiration behind the E2R, the Platinum Record, a Jubilee Anthem for Queen Elizabeth. It's her 70th year on the throne, 96th birthday last month, as well as over a 1,000 years of royal history. He's put together an anthem and using music to tell the story of Queen Elizabeth and the royal family. Also with us today, we have on pianist, musicologist, and founder of Rivermont Records, Brian Wright. Brian came upon a uh, jazz album that was produced in the early 90s, but unfortunately, you know, like life gets in the way, money gets in the way, and unfortunately this jazz classic was not be, was not able to be uh, produced and put out to the public, but someone who was on the original uh, production of the album came across Brian and contacted him, and his label, Rivermont Records, is actually bringing the jazz album to fruition come July 15th, but we're going to be hearing one of the songs off that album, Nobody Sweetheart Today, and also we're going to be hearing the anthem for Queen Elizabeth the Platinum Record, a Jubilee Anthem as well. So we're going to stitch this all together. Busy, busy, jam-packed show. All right, everyone. You know how this goes when we're busy like this. Me and Sin are going to sign off early, but we're going to let the tape run so you can all enjoy. Everyone, have a happy, safe Memorial Day. Thank you to all those who have served and are currently serving. This is Big Fat Joey. Big Fat Joey Show. Biggest thing on Rio here with Sin reminding everyone to... Make, Make every, every sandwich, sandwich count. count. Peace. Peace. All right, everyone. Let's welcome to the line royal expert and commentator and founder of the British monarchist, Thomas Mace Archer Mills. Thomas, welcome to the Big Fat Joey Show. How are you? Hi, Joe. I am absolutely fantastic being here with you and actually back in the area where I am from. So hello to the tri-state area. So happy to be here and honored to be here. Yes, yes. Honored to have you. Excited to have you. I'm going to speak everything British royalty. More importantly, <laughs> we're going to be speaking about you being the creator of something so historical. I, I, wow. I, when you say it like that, I'm like, well, have I really done something that big? And you know, to me, it, it doesn't feel that it's that big because it was an idea of mine and I just I just do things and I'm not better than anyone else and people have ideas every day but I think what I created and the reason I created it is what everyone is just really jumping up and down about it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and to create an anthem for her that not only celebrates her reign of 70 years. It actually celebrates her life of, of 96 years. It celebrates her as head of state of 15 independent countries, of which you know, our neighbors to the north, Canada, a lot of people don't know that Canada is a kingdom and the queen is the queen of Canada. So uh, it, it's very interesting. And I've been so blessed, Joe, in my life and my career to be able to do what I've done. And yeah, it's just so fantastic to not only be a part of this history, but to actually make history in the way 
so many people before have made history and those who are living, such as Her Majesty, is making history as we live and breathe. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about it. Right. You know, you are the visionary behind the E2R, the Platinum Record, a Jubilee Anthem, which on the Queen's birthday this past April 21st was premiered for her 96th, God bless her, 96th birthday and her <laughs> 70th year reigning, as we just spoke about, the Queen of England, but of all the Commonwealths. And, and we were speaking a little bit off air, and I believe uh, under all her Commonwealths, you mentioned there's like 2.6 billion, that's what it be, people, billion people that she oversees. And, you know, just yes. <laughs> first and foremost, Thomas, how did you, or where did the love of, of the royal, everything royal come from? You know, you're a young man living in upstate New York. Well, it's really simple, actually, because my mother and her family, uh, they're all British, British Irish, British Northern Irish. And my grandmother was actually wed in the year that Her Majesty was crowned queen during her coronation. So my grandmother always loved Her Majesty. They were very similar in age. And my grandmother was a little fashionista and she loved jewels and loved clothing and all this. So as I was young, you know, I wasn't reared in a household that had a very strong male influence. My father worked quite a bit. And uh, by doing so, he provided to give us everything we have ever wanted in life. So it was my mother and my grandmother that were really influential on me. And unfortunately, my father's parents weren't around at all and his family wasn't around us. So uh, what I really took to was the history associated with my mother and her family. But not to mention, if anybody knows about New York State and upstate and Lake George, they will know the British history. They will know that the lake was named after King George II, that Bolton Landing was in fact built on land grants from the king. So there's so much British history in the Seven Years' War, which America, we call the French and Indian War. It took place on Lake George. The south end, you have Fort William Henry. The north end, you have Fort Ticonderoga. So in the lake itself is British history. You've got the bateau. You've got the sunken fleet. You've got cannonballs, cannon, musket, everything. So that area is ingrained in British history. And of course, then you have my British family and British roots and all of that. So it's not too far-fetched that I would actually appreciate history. Uh, growing up in that history, but also linking my own family's British history to what actually transpired in upstate New York. So me, it was just being very interested in exploring my history, reclaiming my history, and then saying, I love history, so let's do something with it. And that's what led me to where I am today, Joe. Long story short. And you know what? I'm super excited that that led you to me because, you know, the, the British family <laughs> is, they're interesting, you know, especially that, you know, we're not talking about people from 100, 2, 3, 4, 500 years ago. We're talking about contemporaries, people that are living and breathing right now as we speak. They're doing something maybe monumental in the world. Um, maybe yeah. not, you know, maybe they're just sitting down watching TV or they're writing some sort of a peace agreement somewhere or, or you know, something <laughs> that'll be in the history books. Not only are we going to speak about the anthem you wrote for the Jubilee, you've also written a handful of books, and everyone, everyone loves a good book to read. So you had a book <laughs> that, you, that you wrote in 2018, and I love, I love the title. When they rain, and we're not talking about water rain, they pour uh, a book about <laughs> the British. You know, I, I love to play on words. Can you tell us a little bit about that book and what, what made you want to write it? Yes, well, look, you know, everyone likes a good stiff cocktail, and uh, I, I, I like cocktails, but I like the history behind cocktails, and we've never stopped to think about gin. What's the root of gin? And then if I did research on it, I found that there's royal roots of gin. There's royal roots to vodka. There's royal roots to actually a lot of the spirits that we drink. And a lot of times these spirits were used politically against 
two different countries based on who their king was and what they thought about the spirit. Okay. <laughs> so I said, okay. So this kind of followed on from my first book I wrote in 2012, which was similar. Now, in order to write these books, which is, of course, very heavily reliant on history, but not just history, it's the royal history, because these books not only discover the roots of the, of the spirit themselves, there's drink mixes, there's cocktail recipes, there's everything that members of the royal family drink, why they prefer things, what they prefer. And in order to be one of the first ever royal historians to really research about the drinking habits of the royal family, <laughs> I had to keep the palace updated as to the book, what was happening, this and that. Uh, a little fact for you that according to the government guidelines and the timed consumptions of Her Majesty's drinks, our government would consider the queen a binge drinker. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had to be very careful to say, okay, right, I need to present this in a way that doesn't make the royal family look to be alcoholics because they're really not. Although, I will say, the queen mother lived to 102 almost, 101 in seven months. The queen is 96. The members of the royal family have longevity, and I really think it's because of the botanicals in the gin that actually help them with their health. So uh, I could be wrong, but I think their example and their gin consumption is something I'm working on myself. Live long and prosper. Yes, <laughs> so, yes I, I can uh, see that. Yeah, but uh, Joe, that book was so important because I teamed up with uh, the royal chef, Rob Kennedy, who was Her Majesty's chef at Sandringham, uh, which is the Mili British Military Academy. And he is chef for members of the royal family, Her Majesty, and he's a friend and a patron of mine, in my organization. So he did some lovely finger foods and canapes for the book. Uh, we teamed up with a lot of royal warrant holders. Angostura Bitters, they sponsored the book. Uh, Tangeray, which has the royal warrant for gin. Uh, a lot of the spirit manufacturers hold a royal warrant. And a royal warrant is, in fact, a mark of royal approval. It's a seal of approval that the queen loves their product and only drinks and uses their product. So it is a royal endorsement Very if you are too. getting the royal warrant. Yeah, there's there's no better marketing than having a member of the royal family use your products. <laughs> so, but this book also, Their Majesty's Mixers When They Rain They Pour, was an historic book for me because I won the 2018 Gourmand Award for this book. Now, the Gourmand Award... Thank you so much. The Gourmand Award scheme actually parallels the Michelin scheme where they award the stars to restaurants. So I took number one, first place for the United Kingdom with that book in 2018. And it was such an honor. Well, you know, Thomas, that sounds great. And, you know, having the seal of approval from the Queen of England, your E2R, <laughs> the platinum record, a jubilee anthem. What a great, great yeah. honor you to be a part of that, for you to be the, the inspiration behind it. So tell us a little bit about that and how that came to be. And obviously, it was introduced on her 96th birthday, which was the 21st of April. So let's hear yes. all about it. Well, before we jump into that, I do have to say it debuted on the Queen's birthday, literally at the number one and number two spot on the iTunes classical chart and number 27 on the top 100 chart. I couldn't have asked for any better on the Queen's birthday than having the song hit number one and number two. And the reason it hit number one and number two is because there's two tracks that make up this one anthem. Okay. And I'll tell you why, Joe, because how do I put 70 years of a reign and 96 years of a life into four minutes of song? Right. right. Now, if, if, if Taylor Swift can release an 11 and a half minute song, well, why can't I? But Why then not? we said, well, we're, we're not Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did is said, right, what, what are we going to capture here? So the, the main song, which is We Thank You From Our Hearts, is a literal musical voyage around the world to each one of Her Majesty's realms and territories, and really expressing thanks from all of her people around the world. And 
You would mention the 2.6 billion people in the Commonwealth. And yes, they are her people. But when we look at the greater scheme of things, all you have to do is hold up a picture of the queen. And in any language, people will say the queen because right. they know who she is. And in the United States, okay, we as, as Americans might not be subjects of her majesty, but we like her. We're fans. We're familiar with her because she's been there so long. Yes. So I said, right. I made notes. I made hours and hours of notes. And I said, right, okay, how am I doing this? In 2012, uh, we had created something similar with like a diamond. And I said, there's so much room for improvement. And I'm always someone who says, right, we've done this, but if we're going to do it again, how do we change it to actually beat what we did before? Because there's always room for improvement, whether it's self-improvement or the things that we do or the people we help. And that's so important, Joe, is how do we better ourselves? How do we better our craft? So I said, right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all the history I know, pinpoint and literally file into an A, B, C, and D category. It, actually, I could go from A to Z right. and try to figure out what is the most important of the Queen's reign and life we need to put into this. Continuity, succession, a thousand years of this country's story in her blood. It, it's about building the Commonwealth. It's about creating who she is as a head of state but also creating who she is as a young mother who has just been thrust upon a very international duty. So we went around the Commonwealth. We chose the musical instruments that best represent those, those areas, such as the steel drums of the Caribbean, the didgeridoo of Australia. Uh, we brought in Maori chanting, Hindi chanting, Swahili language to create this authentic, musical thank you, if you will. Now, my friend Anton, <clears throat> Anton Vandermeer, excuse me, is a well-known opera singer from South Africa, and he was here and still is here. Uh, his partner is British. And we got to talking one day during the lockdown, and I said, Anton, your musical, you're a, an opera singer, a producer, a composer, all of this. Would you help me, please? <laughs> I'm so desperate to have some direction because... I can write, I'm a historian, all of that, but where setting things to music seems so easy for people in that craft, right. for me, I get bent out of shape, Joe, and you don't want me to sing one little note for you because I will break your windows. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So uh, Anton said, right, just tell me what you want. Let's talk about it. So what it turned into during lockdown, and thank God Zoom extended that 40-minute you know, yes. ending time and right. just let us go indefinitely so we spent tens and tens of man hours going over my notes and, and going over these lyrics and writing the lyrics according to the notes and Anton would say right I know what you're putting in here I know but this word actually musically and lyrically doesn't fit so what is the cinnamon that we can put there and da 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 so at the end of the day long story short we devised lyrics that we're able to start from the minute she became queen to where we are now, 70 years later, and include the 2.6 billion people of the Commonwealth and the governments of which she is head of state and queen to those people within that 2.6 billion people figure. Now, something huge, and people will appreciate this, national treasure. She is so fantastic. Leslie Garrett, CBE. She's been gonged by the Queen. And when I say gonged by the Queen, that means given a recognition for services to music in the United Kingdom. She has been given a CBE, which is a commander of the British Empire. It's the highest you can get in the civilian honors scheme okay. that awards people for fantastic contributions to society and to the arts. So the Queen gave her this, and she is a friend and a patron and a wonderful, wonderful person, so sweet. But she is so in tune with what we were doing. She said, Thomas, I'd be honored to get involved. Now, this is someone who's had her own show. She's the UK's most recognized soprano, and she had her own BBC show for years. So it's great. We've got Leslie on board. Love this. 
So then through our PR and some of our other friends and actually through Dr. Olga Thomas, who is a patron of my organization, but a good friend of mine, she is the private composer to Her Majesty and the Royal Family. And she said, right, um, one of my people I know uh, could help us figure out who we should have for the lead, so for the, for the male lead. So we thought about a lot of people, this and that, and a, a gentleman named Rodney Earl Clark, who is a fantastic voice. He is a baritone. He stars in the West End's Les Miserables, oh, but he okay. was also the first, oh yeah, fantastic. He was the first black British opera singer to sing the national anthem, God Save the Queen, at rugby. Wow. So, and that's huge. I mean, that's history making right there. But his operatic voice is second to none, and it's velvet. It, it you just get this really soft but yet warm, powerful, velvety vibe when he speaks, and he compliments Leslie so well. But then we also said, well, hey, wait a minute, we need a choir. We want, uh, we want everything that this song can be. And sure enough, in my fashion, if I want it, I work for it and I go out and get it. And we were introduced to the London Community Gospel Choir. And you've got the show America's Got Talent. Well, we have Britain's Got Talent. Yes. And the the London Community Gospel Choir are finalists on Britain's Got Talent. But even before that, they were internationally acclaimed and renowned for their soulful gospel sound. And they came on board and said, yes, Thomas, we will do this with you. Fantastic. Basil Mead, who's the creator of the London Community Gospel Choir, he's an MBE gonged by the Queen, which means a member of the British Empire. So his gong's not as high as as Leslie's, but he still has one nonetheless. Yes, <laughs> so a gong, a gong is a gong. All, That's right. That's right. Except for those of you that watch Downton Abbey, we're not calling people to dinner. We're actually awarding people. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, Downton Abbey, a little. uh, They use a lot of artistic uh, licensing on that show. Oh, they do. Don't get me going on that like we did The Crown in the Green Room. So, uh, but this song, we have the who's who. We've got the decorated. We've got the, the best musicality available to us in this country. So it was an honor to not just work with them, but to have them all believe in what we're celebrating, believe in the duty and the service of what Her Majesty has given. It was only right for us to give back in such a way that the music is an educational understanding of who the Queen is and what she is. But the song that comes before that is a sort of introduction, but a song on its own, which is called The Four British Nations. That was composed by Dr. Olga Thomas, again, the private composer to Her Majesty and the Royal Family. Uh, And I asked her, I said, Dr. Thomas, you've had so many number one hits on the classical charts. You've worked with so many people. Uh, Will you help me? Will you do this for me? Will you do this with me? And she said, Thomas, anything for you. I love your ideas. I love what you want. Tell me what you want. So I conveyed to her exactly what it is I was looking for. She said, right, let me work in my mind and and stew on it a little bit. Now, Dr. Thomas has this uncanny ability to when she writes notes and plays on the piano, she hears the entire chorus of an ensemble and orchestra in her head. So my phone would go at one in the morning two in the morning, because that's when she's the most creative. And if you know about creatives, Joe, we're like vampires. We stay up all night because we can work uninterrupted. So it's nothing for my friends and coworkers to phone me at one and two in the morning. They know I'm awake. So here we are at one thirty, two in the morning. She's banging on her keyboard with literally her handset on speaker. Meanwhile, my ear is literally bleeding. <laughs> it's like, now you can't hear the strings. You can't hear any of this, but I can, and it sounds lovely, but I want to play this for you. What are your thoughts? So we created a slow march to quick march, and everything was just classical and instrumental. And I said, it's lovely. You are a genius. I love this. It's exactly what I want, but I'm going to go further. I'm going to stretch this as far as I can to bring it to breaking point. And she said, you know, when you're so creative, you're brilliant, but you scare me. (laughs) And I do this to people because I always want more and I always want the best. 
Right. And um, I said, let's do it. We've got fantastic artistic musical voices. I know you work in the instrumental business. I get it. But why can't we throw in exaltations? Why can't we hearken back to the images and imagery of Westminster Abbey, of the coronation? Because the very name of this this segment, the four British nations, starts with the Queen's story of her coronation at Westminster Abbey, the Queen of all four United Kingdoms, which make up the United Kingdom. She said, well, let's try it. Let's do it. So we got Leslie and, and Rodney and the choir back into the studio. And I actually took the Eli- Elisabetta Regina and the Vivats, uh, which comes kind of from Perry's I Was Glad, which has been at the coronations of British monarchs for hundreds of years. But it was redone uh, with that wording, Vivat Regina Elisabetta for the Queen's coronation. So I took the Latin and rearranged how it is. So from the beginning, you hear the vivats, which is just loud and full, and it's an exclamation. Now in Latin, vivat Elisabetta Regina, or vivat Regina Elisabetta, is long live Queen Elizabeth. And the name of this total, total anthem, E2R, the platinum record. This is a play as well because Elisabetta Regina is Latin for Queen Elizabeth. The two I's, which is Roman numerals for number two. So in Latin, when you see the Queen's cipher, the E, little twos, the R is Queen Elizabeth II. Okay. That is her cipher. So we created that. But the platinum record, yes, we've created a record. We hope it goes platinum. <laughs> so everyone, please download it, listen to it, share it. Um, but It's a play on words as well, because we're celebrating the Queen's platinum record, 70 years of her service, which makes up the platinum jubilee. So that's the way the song was actually titled. So we have the two parts, the two movements, if you will, the four British nations, classical with exaltations, slow march into a quick march, and then that blends into the World Showcase. But at the end of the World Showcase, which is we thank you from our hearts, that comes back around and you hear not only the world music, but then it brings you back to the United Kingdom through the bagpipes, through the Irish flute and all of that. So we've done a whole circumnavigation of not only from the United Kingdom all the way around the world and back here to the United Kingdom, but through the Queen's reign. It started in Africa, She was crowned in the United Kingdom, and she's built the Commonwealth of Nations of 54 independent countries to end up back where we are today, 70 years later. So the symbolism in the lyrics, the symbolism in the music, the instruments, the singing, this is nothing more than a musical representation of the history that has been so important to not just the Queen and the thousand years of history of the royal family, but the world as we know it today and what she's been a part of for the last 70 years. That's what the song is about. And you know what? I, I, first and foremost, I, I've, I've heard it, 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 it. It's just magical. I don't know if I've ever been able to use for it, but I am, not only am I impressed with the people you brought on to assist you in putting this together, because, yes, we all have our strengths. You're, you're a great writer, great historian. Music is not your thing per se. But I give you kudos. You're you're putting oh. like a thousand. Like you said, you're putting a thousand years of history, seventy years of the queen being the queen, ninety six years of her life, into a few minutes of music, and that is just yeah. remarkable. Because you know, uh, you know, Taylor Swift wrote wrote a song for eleven and a half minutes, and she's a young lady. I don't know. She's in her mid twenties, I'm guessing. Um, I, you know, I don't think she's done as many. Um, Monumental, even though I'm a Swifty fan, I love, I love Taylor Swift. Don't get me wrong. Oh yeah, the, I think the Queen. Yeah, has... I've got a blank space, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the Queen's got a couple more uh, achievements in her life, and, but for you to be able to put it into a few minutes of songs and really get the feel for everything the Queen has done throughout history in her life is just remarkable. So yeah, I I, I tip my hat to you, and uh, you know. I'm gonna, <laughs> You know, chitty old mate. I don't know what other phrase would be, would be apropos well, at this point. Tip, tip. <laughs> and, you know, but, you know to, I really, really appreciate it, Joe. And just, I, I want to throw in the symbology 
of the lyrics because one of the choruses starts with the queen's unblemished face. And then the next chorus is the queen's maturing face. So as you listen to the song, as the song progresses, so does the queen's life, so does her image, so have we known her to grow and mature. So what we started with 70 years ago is very different to what we have now. And that's reflected actually in the image of her face. So that is there in that song as well. It goes so deep, Joe. And and for you to understand and really give me such a, a lovely, warm fuzzy that you did, thank you. Because I, I really hope that we can evoke that understanding from everyone who listens to the song the same as it did with you. And, and thank you so much for that. Well, what's, And thank you for being a positive proponent of the royal family, because uh, you know, listen, they're real people. At the end of the day, the queen's mm-hmm. a queen. But she's a she's a real person, a real woman. Uh, you know, her children are real people. Yes. Her grandchildren are real people. And it's it's so good to see you know all the great that she and her family have done. Yeah, listen, you peel yeah. back you peel back the onion on anybody, you always find something. It's like ah, eh, you know, mm-hmm. well, and they do, right. they do. But, but the positive attributes, Joe. This is this is someone who truly is not about herself. Exactly. She's given her life in service and duty. And, and this is the thing. This is why I gravitate to it and why I want to help because the crown is very misunderstood and it sits above politics. And for the listeners, you know, in America, one thing I didn't realize is that we don't have anything above the political spectrum to unite us. Nope. And at this point in time where this country, well, America, my home country, my birth country, is being so torn apart, more down the middle than ever, with just politics pulling at us. Mm-hmm. What do we actually have in America to unite us? Where are we just Americans without the politics? And this is why when I saw what the crown did and what the, the person who is the monarch does, is they sit above politics. They bring people together, regardless if you're left or right of the aisle. They take the politics out of it, strip it down and say, today, here with me, we're not political. We're all British. Imagine someone above the president in Congress and the Senate to say, right, Mr. President, you actually report to me because I am responsible for the well-being and goodness of my people. And if you're not doing your job, you need to come and meet with me every week on Tuesday at seven o'clock and let me know what you were doing with my government because it's the queen's government. It's in her name. Right. So our government in the United Kingdom reports to the actual sovereign and under the sovereign, we're all British regardless of which party we voted for. So there's that unifying bit, which actually made me realize that there is worth and value in something more to the crown that sits for every person, regardless of what we believe is there to support us as subjects of something bigger when you take politics out of it. And there's something to be said for that, because when we are looking at celebrating next week, all of these parties, we have four days of celebrations. We have, this country gave everybody two days off in two extra bank holidays for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And we're not going to celebrate a president who has only been there four years. We're not going to celebrate some politician who is like, yeah, I live in a really great house and this and that, and I get everything I want. We're going to celebrate this country. We're going to celebrate a thousand years of history in this one person. We're going to celebrate Her Majesty, who is there for any of us, regardless of color, religion, sex, sexuality, anything, because she represents the nation in all of its perfection and imperfection. We just don't have the messiness of politics that interferes with that sort of sobriety. And that's what it's all about. That's why I educate the way I do. That's why I take the education and the history and the royal bits of that, and I apply it to society today. And what we as society, as we as younger people, can actually learn from the example Her Majesty has been to the world for 70 years and how she has not only avoided conflict, but she has bridged the gap between political conflict to bring countries together. And that's what a true statesman does, looks out for the well-being of the people, regardless of the politics, because at the end of the day, it's the people who suffer if the politics are disjointed. 
And this woman understands that. So that's why I do what I do, Joe. And thank goodness that you do that. Now, speaking of doing what you do, how can my audience find, follow, and keep up with everything Thomas Mace, Archer Mills, as well as <laughs> download the E2R, the Platinum Record, the Jubilee Anthem? How can we do this? <laughs> I, I think that's really kind that uh, people would want to follow me. Uh, first and foremost, the song is, is so important. So please visit the, or the, the Jubilee Anthem 2022.com. Again, that's treble W, the Jubilee Anthem 2022.com. That tells all about the history. You can download the song there. You can stream it there. Every musical platform is there from Amazon, iTunes, Deezer, Tidal, everything, Spotify. We're everywhere, Joe. So that's where they can get that. But for me, um, they can go right to the British Monarchist Society, which is the monarchists. Dot com. We have Facebook, Instagram. We just we're down with the kids. We have TikTok now. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, we're really yeah. I know you're going to see me doing these little sort of things in front of the palette. No, I wouldn't do that to you. I swear. <laughs> but we we are getting everything going on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Even though the Twitter sphere is not real and it's a negative place, we don't really like it that much. But it allows us to put really nice things out there and, and really sort of engage with a good bunch of people that are positive. So we are on Twitter. Well, that sounds great. Well, Thomas, Mace, Archer Mills, thank you for being on the Big Fat Joey Show. I wish you nothing but luck and success in all that you do, and long live the queen. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye.
All right, everyone. Let's welcome to the line pianist, musicologist, and founder of Rivermont Records, Brian Wright. Brian, welcome to the Big Fat Joey Show. How are you? Hi, Joey. I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being on. Super, super excited. I love what we're about to talk about today. We talked off air a little bit, and I, I just love when opportunities of this nature happen to present themselves, that you find something that has been sitting on a dusty shelf for eons or 30-some-odd years, and you bring it back to life. You found some classical jazz music produced by the great legendary producer George Avakian, and you're bringing it back to life, one step to Chicago. Can you tell me a little bit about how this all came to be? Sure. So the backstory is that in 1992, George Avakian, who was already at that time an established jazz producer, uh, he had been producing records for the likes of Louis Armstrong, Dave Brubeck, Miles Davis, Billy Holiday, all of these folks, um, got together three generations of jazz musicians in the RCA studios in New York for really an all-day, all-star session, recreating the jazz music associated with Frank Teschmacher, who was a legendary Chicago-area clarinetist in the late 20s and early 1930s. And the session in 1992 featured people like uh, Bob Haggart and Milt Hinton, who were both veterans of the 1930s and 40s, along with pianist Dick Hyman, um, bass saxophonist Vince Giordano, uh, banjoist Marty Gross, uh, really just a who's who of classic and traditional jazz. And they recorded this full album which was scheduled for release on a major label. And at the last minute, after it had all been in the can, uh, the label backed out. They said it was simply too expensive. He had run up too big of a bill, and they didn't have the money to pay him back for this session. So it went on to the shelf uh, in hopes that uh, another label could be found to put it out. And it sat there uh, for what was first five years, then 10, then 20 and eventually, unfortunately, George Avakian died at the age of 98 without having ever seen it released. God bless him. And a couple of years ago, 98. Uh, what a, a long and amazing career he had. But a few years ago, one of the musicians on this recording came to me, uh, knew of my label and said, you know, we think this would be a good fit for your label. Is this something you'd be interested in? And I was just blown away because these are all all of these musicians are uh, heroes of mine and the opportunity to have a hand in finally releasing this legendary recording was just something I couldn't pass up. And that's what I love about the story. You know, this is sitting on some dusty shelf for 30 some odd years. And thank goodness. One of the musicians who's on the record is still around, still with us. Number one and had the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the the knowledge or the want or the desire to want to put this out there. And he came upon yourself, uh, someone who, you know, appreciates what exactly they did 30 years ago. And, and you and yourself and being the owner of your record label, that you're finally going to let it see the light of day. Right. So we had to get the permission of the Avakian family and the New York Public Library, where a lot of Avakian's papers and uh, things went. And it took about two years. We worked all through the pandemic on this, but we were finally able to line up all the proper permissions, um, have a new master made from the analog session tapes, because although this was done in the early 90s, Avakian being somewhat of the old school insisted that they record it on big reels of analog tape. And uh, so we had to do the, the digital conversion and uh, get it prepared for release. And then there were additional slowdowns because of uh, physical production problems during the pandemic with paper shortages and the like. Uh, but it's finally here. And, it's, and as you said, you know, even though this was only done 30 years ago, which is not a long time ago, but luckily in the, the world of 
music, TV, film, electronics, computers, the equipment is leaps and bounds, uh, so much more advanced that they're able to take something that, you know, tape does not like to be, tape does not like to be, uh, you know, hang around. It, it, it deteriorates very quickly. Well, correct. And, um, you know, fortunately this was done with fully professional equipment at the RCA studios and we were able to get to the tape in time and get a very, very good sounding transfer. It has that nice analog warmth to it. Um, but it's uh, a fully professional recording. Now, even I know it's jazz, but can you give us a sense of the uh, the flavor of jazz that this record is going to be? Sure. So there's actually two types of jazz on this record. Um, Avakian had a vision for this album that was perhaps a bit unusual. The first half of the album features a band led by pianist Dick Hyman, who himself had been around since the early 1950s. Uh, playing as a jazz pianist and leading various jazz ensembles through the years. And Dick Hyman's specialty, at least one of them, he has many, <laughs> one of them is to recreate note-for-note note, uh, jazz recordings of the 1920s. And that's what the first half of the album is. So Dick Hyman listened to these 78 RPM records of the late 20s that featured clarinetist Frank Teschmacher and he transcribed all of the parts, all of the different instruments, wrote out the solos, wrote out the arrangements, and presented this to the musicians in his band for this recording. And so what you hear is uh, exactly what the record sounded like in the late 20s, but with today's fidelity. I mean, the performances match pretty exactly those of the 1920s musicians. And it's a hot Chicago-style jazz I think of the prohibition era okay and it's it's wild and exciting and youthful stuff um and uh, the second half of the album features clarinetist kenny deverne and a band that he put together for the session which plays more contemporary style jazz arrangements of tunes from the late 20s and early 30s so the style changes quite dramatically midway through the record now, we're going to play, on today's show, we're going to play one of the songs that dropped the other day, Nobody's Sweetheart. What's Nobody's Sweetheart all about? What's the, what, 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 can, what, what can we look forward to getting out of this? Well, um, so this comes from the second half of the album. Uh, so this is one of the performances in a, a bit more of a, a modern arrangement, at least modern in 1992. And, and maybe even then, it's not fair to call it modern modern, but it's uh, an updated rendition and um, we'll hear some some terrific musicians on this i mean the band includes a trumpeter john eric kelso trombonist dan barrett uh, kenny deverne is the clarinetist the, the late great kenny deverne dick hyman plays piano and and listen for the way he just comes in with these little piano fills between the main lines of melody it's, it's very tasteful very elegant um i tend to think of it i i don't want to back myself into a corner by calling it sophisticated, but it's, it's very uh, thoughtful music. Anyway, Howard Alden is the guitarist. Uh, Milt Hinton is the bassist. And Milt Hinton had been performing as a jazz bassist going back to the early 1930s and was on sessions with just about everybody, rock and roll sessions, jazz sessions, uh, all through the uh, 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s. And then the drummer is a fellow... Uh, named Tony DeNicola, quite a well-known jazz drummer from the New Jersey area. But the song itself, Nobody's Sweetheart, goes back to 1924 and was written by uh, Elmer Schomel, Schobel, excuse me, who was one of the members of the uh, pioneering jazz band, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings. And it was a standard in the day and has stayed in the repertoire of a lot of jazz bands since then. Brian, how can my audience find, follow, and keep up with everything Brian Wright, everything with your... Rivermount Records, as well as Keep Up With One Step to Chicago. Sure. Well, the album One Step to Chicago will be available on all the major platforms, Spotify, iTunes, uh, whatever your choice of music listening service is, you'll be able to find it. Now, the full album doesn't release until July 15th, um, but as you mentioned, we've got this track, Nobody's Sweetheart, available for listening now. 
Uh, if you're in the mood for the physical version, which comes packaged in a very nice little hardback book with an 80-page uh, liner note that will tell you all about the session with dozens of photographs of the musicians in action. That was another thing George Avakian uh, was very clever to do is he had a professional photographer at the session so you can be a fly on the wall as you leaf through the booklet and, and see how this all came together. Um, but the CD and a 2LP deluxe vinyl edition uh, will be available directly from the Rivermont Records website, which is www.rivermontrecords.com. That's R-I-V-E-R-M-O-N-T, rivermontrecords.com. Or you can find us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash rivermontrecords. Well, Brian Wright, pianist, musicologist, and founder of Rivermont Records. Thank you for being on the Big Fat Joey Show. It's been a pleasure. I wish you nothing but luck and success in all that you do. Well, thank you so much, Joey. It's been a real pleasure for me to be here. I appreciate it. Have a great day. We'll speak soon. Bye-bye.
Mm-hmm. 